we are running a business, we're in an environment as an employee. How can we tell that there's poor leadership practices in place? What are some of the things that we see and hear that let us know that? I think the most obvious red flag, if you like, usually is you look at the, the staff, the people in, in the office or in the, the business, whatever that form that takes, and you can usually read it in the mood in the room. Can't wait. It's like they're saying that I am only here because a paycheck is involved, which is why companies have to give huge bonuses and loyalty rewards and perks and benefits. The next best thing is actually just go and have a conversation with your manager. The way to handle that conversation is the, is the trick. And I think if you make it about yourself and not about them or their leadership, yeah. then you'll be much more likely to get some sort of outcome or at the very least just be able to raise it without getting fired if that's what you're worried about. The right, there's always a problem, like you said. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, it's, it's very easy to just be like, well, nobody ever complains, so everything must be brilliant. But that's not necessarily the case, is it? That's the worst <laughs> thing possible, right? Um, and it's, it's things like, that seem quite simple on the face of it, but are usually quite difficult in practice. So it's things like putting new people first, having just the simple, conversation that sometimes can save a uh, you know, week's worth of angst and difficulty if you just start with a question at the beginning. You know, how, how do you feel about this? What's your opinion on that? Do you think we could do this particular piece of work in a different or more efficient way? And I think it's those little traps and myths of leadership that so many managers and business owners lose sight of. Hey guys, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. Today we have a very exciting guest on. One guest that startup entrepreneurs and business owners is going to want to have in their corner because today we're meeting with David Hatch. David, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure, actually. I was looking forward to speaking with you because you're very versed in something that not many of us are in, and that is leadership. The reason why I say it that way is because we're business owners, we're entrepreneurs, we're strategists, we're marketers, and we're doing everything except handling our people very well. And that means relationships. So thank you for coming on and thank you for allowing us a bit of your expertise, knowledge, and experience that is sure to help us on our journey to business success. Well, I hope so. Um, thanks for talking me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. Huh? Let's see how it goes. You know, though. I want to ask you something that we ask all our guests. Where is your favorite city? Ooh, that's oh. a difficult question. How do I choose? Mm. Um, I mean, if I was patriotic, I'd probably say London. Um, but I think it would probably have to be Adelaide, actually, in Australia. Ooh, Australia. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Why Adelaide? I've never heard that one chosen before. Because I used to live there. Uh, a couple of years oh. when we were kids, dad was sent out there for work. And so we went with him. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's mm -hmm. just very, very happy memories, happy mo happy time of life. And yeah, I guess it's just stuck in there. <laughs> no place like home. All right. So let's say that in this scenario, you and I are in Adelaide. We're having a drink, having a drink outside on the patio of a famous restaurant. We're just having a chat while we have a drink. And I see one of my friends approach him. And I say, you know what? I think I'd like you to meet my friend. So our friend, my friend walks over and I say to my friend, friend, this is David. David, this is friend. When my friend meets you, who exactly is David Hatch that he's meeting? Well, that's a good question. Interesting way of putting it as well. I've not heard before. Um, I guess it, we always come back to work, don't we? I'm, Rightly or wrongly, for good or bad, that's how most of us define ourselves, isn't it? And so for me, the last couple of years in particular, what work David looks like really has turned into a leadership podcaster. That's what I spend most of my time doing now. Um, leadership mm -hmm. is something that I've always been interested in. It's become a bit of a passion as a result of some good and bad experiences in the workplace in my previous career. And so, yeah, I, I guess it was part of the COVID thing as well. I needed a project, something to keep my mind busy. Um, and starting a podcast was the first thing that came to mind. So that's what I did. 
uh, and I've been doing it ever since and absolutely loving it because I get to have really interesting conversations about leadership, which I'm really interested in, uh, with all sorts of people all across the world, just like yourself, that I never would have met otherwise, never would have had this conversation. Um, and that's really the, the power of the internet, the power of podcasting and yes. yeah, the way the world works now as of two or three years ago, really. In your forays into leadership podcasting, what are some of the, well, let's say three most important lessons or things that you've learned about leadership that you think everyone needs to know about? Oh, trying to distill it down into three is difficult. <laughs> so we we'll go for five. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, you know, the, there's, there's key lessons about leadership, which I learned during my career before I started the podcast. But I think some of the most surprising things have been to see how heavily those are reinforced by people all across the, the kind of the spectrum of the workplace. Um, and it's, it's things like that seem quite simple on the face of it, but are usually quite difficult in practice. So it's things like putting your people first, having just the simple conversation that sometimes can save uh, you know weeks worth of angst and difficulty if you just start with a question at the beginning you know how, how do you feel about this what's your opinion on that do you think we could do this particular piece of work in a different or more efficient way and I think it's those little traps and myths of leadership that so many managers and business owners lose sight of they fall into those traps because they're thinking more about and quite rightly and understandably so, but they're thinking more about the task or the bottom line, the revenue the or keeping the shareholder happy yeah, or, or whatever it happens to be. And I think it's so easy to forget, especially in our modern, high-tech, complicated world, that none of those things will happen without the people doing the work. So if you don't look after them first, nothing else will happen. Yes. True. Which isn't three or five, it's really a one key lesson isn't it but <laughs> and you know that's um i want to say it's an underappreciated lesson as well because when you think about it the people who tend to spend the most money on your business that's your highest paying clients you and then tem tend to have a better relationship than normal and the other thing that you also understand is that when you were getting started before you were this big however big you are there is always that first one, two, three to five sales. And most times those sales, when you're getting started, you didn't get them because you were the best solution because God knows you weren't. You didn't get them because you had the brand or the marketability or anything like that. You got them because you know, people liked you. You gave a call, you ran into someone, had a conversation and they liked something about you. So that lesson, I would say, is underappreciated. Where did this natural curiosity and interest in leadership come from, though? You said it started in COVID, but I can surmise, so well, Ooh, I no. suppose it started from before. You just acted on it in COVID. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. Uh, I think my, my interest in leadership, I mean, that goes back to when I was a teenager, really. Um, I think COVID was the kind of the spark that, that started the podcast going and gave me the idea of, of how to express it, how to talk about it, how to how to put it out there, um, but yeah. So I mean, it, when I was a teenager, we had we have these things in the UK. They're like youth organisations. There was one uh, sponsored by the Royal Air Force. It was which is called the Air Cadets, and I joined that when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. that really kind of sparked my interest in leadership because it was something that was always kind of present. In hindsight, it wasn't always done that well. And it probably wasn't what mm. I would think of as good leadership today. But that was what really kind of sparked that passion originally was was participating in that as a teenager. Hmm. Interesting. So you've got a natural curiosity from a teenager and uh, you're quite interested. Now, I know that you've had many conversations on your podcast about leadership. You've seen the good and the bad side, experienced the good and the bad sides of poor leadership and good leadership. So let's start with the bad. We are running a business. We're in an environment as an employee. How can we tell that there is poor leadership practices in place? What are some of the things that we see and hear that let us know that? I think the most obvious red flag, if you like, usually is you look at the, the staff, the people in, in the office or in the, the business, whatever that form that takes, 
and you can usually read it in the mood in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You can look at more quantifiable things like staff retention rates. You know, what's the turnover of people moving through that company? How long are they staying? That's not as great an indicator as it used to be, though, because it's becoming a bit more normal now to change jobs every year or two anyway. Might not necessarily mean there's anything wrong with the leadership. But I think for me, it always starts with just have a conversation with people and pretty quickly, <laughs> unless they're being really guarded about it, but most people aren't. If they're, if they're grumpy, they're going to talk about it. That's human nature. So you can figure it out pretty quickly. And it'll just be things like, you know, I, I, there's no point expressing my opinion because no one's going to listen. So I'm just going to keep my head down, do oh. the minimum and just that's it. Um, so it's that kind of stuff. <laughs> mm, wow. I reacted to that because um, I'm working with a client. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know what? I've been doing the marketing really well. The numbers are here. So why isn't why isn't sales as um, increasing in response? Because, you know, the numbers are here from everything that's being done from my end. So let me have a talk with the sales team. And uh, that was the number one thing that I kept hearing. I kept hearing that, hey, it doesn't make sense at all because nothing is going to change. And there were some other frustrating comments. I am taken aback, right? I'm taken aback because here's what's, here's what's interesting, you know. Mm. Unless you have the ears to hear when someone speaks, well, is it you're going to listen, actually? Unless you're actually listening when someone speaks, you'll hear out of what they say. But because you're not listening for key things to indicate to you that this is what's wrong, you might hear it and it doesn't have the impact on you that it should have. We're here and we're sitting with a staff member, for example, you know, just a casual role play. Mm. And they mentioned a few red flags. Um, nothing changes. I can't approach my boss about this problem. And I fear that if I do these things, I might get fired. I fear that if I mention the problem, I might get fired. So it's not a very good situation at all. It's quite poor mind. What are some of the things that you would say an employee or a leader of this company should start with? Because, you know, unless something is done, you know, it's only going to get worse. So what are some of the things that they should start doing to make the situation a lot more tenable, if you might? Yeah, so we can come at that from both directions. I think for the employee, it's... Mm -hmm. It's very easy to just make a sort of flippant comment of, okay, well, go and find another job. You know, that's that's the ultimate recourse that any employee has. However, it's not always that simple. That can actually be a luxury. For some people, they're not able to change job. They're, they're locked in. They've got yeah. bills to pay, kids to feed, mortgage, all that sort of thing. And so they, they quite rightly don't want to take that risk. So if you can't do that, the next best thing is actually just go and have a conversation with your manager. The way to handle that conversation is the is the trick. And I think if you make it about yourself and not about them or their leadership, yeah. then you'll be much more likely to get some sort of outcome or at the very least just be able to raise it without getting fired if that's what you're worried about. So if you say things, yeah. you know, sentences such as, you know, when these things happen, this is the impact it's having upon me. This is the way I'm viewing that. This is how it makes me feel rather than, you're doing a terrible job managing my team because you're doing this, 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 and this wrong. Because if you do the second one, then what's going to happen? Of course, the manager's going to react badly. They're going to be offended, get defensive. Yeah, it's not my fault. You're being a rubbish worker, you know, all of that. And you can see where that argument immediately will go. So that would be my first recommendation for for the employee is raise it. Because the other thing to remember as well, most managers, even the bad ones, they probably don't realize the impact that what they're doing is having on their people because most people don't set out they don't go to work every morning and think right i'm going to make everyone's life miserable today i'm going to be the worst manager they've ever seen they're going to hate working nobody sets out with that as their goal do they so mm-hmm. most likely is they're just doing the best they can or the the doing it in the way they think is best or the way they've seen it done before mm-hmm. by managers before them and they may not realize the yeah. impact it's having so raising it might actually be doing them a favor. They might be grateful to hear what the problems are and see it as an opportunity for improvement. And that, I think, leads us into answering the question from the other side, from the leadership point of view, which is you want to hear the problems. Because if you don't hear the problems, you can't solve the problems. 
So if you have created a culture where nobody ever comes to you with their concerns, that is a red flag for you, for yourself, for your leadership. It doesn't mean there are no problems because what business can say we haven't got any issues? Not many, yeah. if any. <laughs> I don't think it, exactly right. There's always a problem, like you said. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And I think, you know, it's, it's very easy to just be like, well, nobody ever complains, so everything must be brilliant. But that's not necessarily the case, is it? That's the worst <laughs> sign possible, right? They yeah. say that if you're in a relationship and your partner isn't, well, not constantly, because who, who wants to be in a relationship like that? But if your partner and yourself are having disagreements in your relationship, it means that they've already found someone and they're having disagreements with that person. Yeah. You just don't know yet. So well, is, yeah. if you're not hearing about problems, which is, you know what I like to think about it as? I like to think that the, the problems that we see are opportunities to improve and to get better. Absolutely. No, I completely agree with that. And it's, I mean, it's the same with mistakes and errors at work, isn't it? Like, they're, they're not... They're not failures, they're just lessons, which is a very simplistic way of saying it, but it is the truth, isn't it? And I think, so from that leadership perspective, then if you are the manager and and you feel like maybe one of those red flags is waving in your face and you haven't been seeing it, what can you actually do to address that culture, to get people feeling more comfortable with talking to you? Because that's a really difficult challenge to try and grapple with. When you're first starting out as a leader, it's pretty easy. You can set the tone from the beginning. But if you've got yourself two or three years down the line and you've only just realised you're in this situation, it's a really difficult one to break out of. And so I think that the first thing is start having one-to-one conversations with everyone in your team. If you're not regularly talking to them and giving them that forum to talk to you and raise things with you and do it from a point of view of Mm -hmm. asking questions and then just be quiet and listen to what they've got to say, whatever it is. And it it does take practice to be able to do that well. And it does take commitment and self-discipline to do it in a way where you're not just getting defensive and trying to throw back everything they say, because again, that can be really damaging. You have to just like ears open, mouth closed Mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Sorry, go on. Oh, please, please. I was just going to say, and then the next thing, once you feel like you're getting better at that, you then have to start acting on what they're telling you because yes. you know you can be the best listener in the whole of the world ever but if you don't do anything with the information you're receiving then they'll very quickly go back to well yeah the boss listens but he never does anything about it so what's the point i won't bother next time and again you're back in that same position mm-hmm. i think that's a basic problem because now they feel like they've put them, themselves out there they have tried to open up and be honest even when they didn't want to and yeah. they weren't heard. So that can also be damaging. You know, it's quite fascinating what we're talking about here because it sounds like a very ABC kind of conversation. But if you know how many people cry when they have to go to work, you know, they don't feel fulfilled. They feel empty inside. They say, thank God it's Friday. Kill me now, it's Monday. <laughs> it's actually a trend. And... They can't wait. It's like they're saying that I am only here because a paycheck is involved, which is why companies have to give huge bonuses and loyalty rewards and perks and benefits. They're not giving it because the employees have originally been loyal or because they've been engaged. They're giving it because it's become just an exchange of value. I give you eight hours of my day, I'll be productive for three, and you pay me for 40 hours of work each week. And if you want me to give you five hours of productive energy each day, you're going to have to give me such and such a bonus. It's quite a dreadful interaction between business and employees sometimes. You know? Yeah, and the the pay rise and the perks thing is an interesting one as well because how often is it mm-hmm. that that happens before they know you, you're planning to quit and you're unhappy? It's, 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 it's usually too little, too late kind of thing. It's, oh, no, he's about to leave. We better, we better offer him a pay rise to get him to stay. And that's the worst possible time to do it, isn't it? Because it's like, oh, so mm-hmm. now you're saying I'm worth this, but for the last two years or however long I've worked for you, you were quite happy to just keep paying me less. So, yeah, mm-hmm. pay people as, as close to what they're worth as you can within a capitalist system. And what are some of the things that we can do for employees to help them feel valued, appreciated, and engaged? Is it more like um, employee of the month, um, monthly birthday celebrations? What, what, what are some of those things that we could do? 
I have mixed feelings about employee of the month and, and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. I think if you're going to do that, it's got to be really specific to the to the individuals. It can't be generic because uh, what I've seen a few times is it gets a bit. The management team get towards the end of the month and they've not really been thinking about it and it's too late and so there's this big panic and you just pick the nearest person or, or whatever and it's you've got to be a bit intentional about it you've got to be careful about it mm-hmm. and you've got to reward because mm-hmm. usually there'll be something goes with that employee of the month it's not just your picture on the wall is it it'll be like a, a voucher for starbucks or something like that but it's got to be something that's relevant mm-hmm. that they want otherwise yeah it mm-hmm. doesn't really work does it <laughs> Um, but and I think really, really it's, bad blood, doesn't it? well, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, it's like oh, I worked really hard for this whole month, and I got like ten dollars to spend at Starbucks. Great, I'll really try hard <laughs> next month, sort of thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. or or they might be a coffee fiend and might be really happy with that. It might be great, uh, like me. I would love that mm-hmm. because I'm a, I'm an addict to coffee. Mm-hmm. I, I admit it. Um, but I think really it's it's about more than that kind of the the sort of the tokenism approach to to incentive, isn't it? What you really want is people who are bought into what your mission as a company is and the objectives you're trying to achieve, that they believe in your leadership, they are they trust you to lead them, they respect what you're trying to do, all of those nice things. And some of the best ways to achieve that, really, I mean, what it is, it's listening to people, isn't it? It's what I said earlier. It's how often are you talking to them? How often are you listening to what they're saying? How often are you doing something about what they tell you? And it doesn't always have to be concerns and problems. It could be ideas and innovations and new or better ways of doing things. But if again, if you're not listening, you're ne- you're missing out on all of that and you're making them feel like they're not heard. And if they're not heard, they won't feel valued. And if they don't feel valued, then they'll start thinking about, am I being paid enough to stay here? And if the answer is no, then they're gone. And we're back to staff retention uh-huh. again. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, something that I don't think businesses, and this is based on experience, I don't think businesses spend enough time thinking about this, just as you mentioned, staff retention. Mm. When you lose a staff member that's been a part of your company for years, the opportunity cost of hiring a new candidate, a new employee, so finding that that candidate, hiring them, or screening and hiring them, and then training them to perform as well as the employee that, recently left or left a few years ago at this stage because it takes so long how much money you've lost in that process and one of the things i've found happen is that in the business so you remember when elon took over twitter's x right indeed and then there was like a slew of layoffs like thousands of people lost yeah. their job that's what happens eventually because now you have 80 percent of the work being done by 20 percent of the people so even though you're paying such and such an amount. It's really a few people who are carrying the bulk of the load. But here's where it gets terrible. And I don't think I don't think this is highlighted enough in the corporate world. You see those 20% of people in the company, they're the ones that's keeping it afloat. It's not the CEO, it's not the CTO, it's not the director, manager, anybody. It, it's mm-hmm. those people. They're the ones that knows the ins and outs, the nooks, the crannies, and everything about the business. They're the ones that makes it tick as they would put it, they then hold the company ransom or hostage directly or indirectly because now the company realizes that if such and such a person doesn't come into work, then everything is going to burn down. We're in for a tough day. We can't do without such a person. Meanwhile, the company has over a 1,000 employees, over a 100 employees. And that right there, I think, like you said, comes from a disengaged workforce. A disengaged workforce because only people with high levels of is it conscientiousness is the word I'm looking for. They take value and pride in their work. They're the yeah. ones that are going to spend the most time trying to get the work done, regardless of what's going on around them. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's it is. I mean, it is a problem. It's well established. Um, I mean, there's mm-hmm. like global workforce statistics. I think Gallup, it was, did a poll a few years back, and they reckoned the the global average for employees who said they were it was less than 20%. I mean, that's quite a scary number, isn't it? When you, when you stop to think about it, there's only 20% of people who are actively engaged with their jobs as managers. We should be quite worried about that, I think. Um, and then the next statistic that I'll quote to you, which was a follow on question was 
what is it that has the most impact on that number? And it was more than 70% of people said, well, it's my manager. So there we go. That's why leadership matters. It's those two statistics right there. More than 20% more than twenty of people said it was what? Less than 20% said they were actively engaged at work. Um, and more than 70%, I think it might even have been 80%, said the fact that they had the most impact on that was their manager. Oh, you know something I want to ask you? You mm. know how the structures of companies are. So you have the C-suites, mm. right? so you have the board, of C-suites and execs. Then you have presidents, vice presidents, managers, etc. All, But here's where I want to get to. I want to get to the manager and the team. Manager and team, manager and the team. And then they report to their supervisor and so on. I am beginning to wonder if the best place to implement effective leadership strategies that especially focus on relationship building, problem solving, and cultivating a positive work environment aren't with those managers that work directly with staff. Those manage managers that are in office day after day, they're the team leaders. What do you think about that? That we should train those people first and foremost in problem solving and culture building and so on. I think I would separate culture and leadership to start with. Um, Mm -hmm. Culture, I think, is one of those things. It's like security. Everyone's responsible for it. I think the the whoever it is at the top, the VP, the CEO, whatever they call themselves, they need to set the tone for the culture. And then everyone else throughout the entire organization needs to live up to it as well. Because it's one of those things, I think, that doesn't just work if someone just writes a policy about what the culture is going to look like and sends an email and, and that's it. It has to be something you're managing constantly. You're always thinking about it. You're making sure that you are living up to what you say your culture is. And part of that means being accountable mm-hmm. to it as well, which I think, again, is where quite a lot of leaders fall over. There's that sort of one rule for them, one rule for everyone else sort of approach. The do as I say, not as I do, that kind of thing. But no one's going to follow the culture or the values that you say you want in your organization if you're not visibly doing it first. Leadership, however, I totally agree, I think. And that's actually what I'm all about, really, is that first level of management. That is where Mm -hmm. leadership is able to have the most impact on the most people who are actually responsible for keeping your company working. It's the people who are doing, they're making the widgets, they're putting the rivets in the thing, they're sending the emails, they're interfacing with the customers, they're the ones keeping your company alive at the end of the day. And so that first step up into management, into leadership, those first line managers, they're the ones who need the most leadership training in my opinion that they should be the first ones to get it but how many times how many companies have you worked for where that was the case or where any leadership was offered to those managers at all or any other training full stop frankly they're one of the most Mm -hmm. overlooked Mm -hmm. groups in terms of training um and and so we have this problem don't we which I, i can never remember who coined it but the the accidental manager which is this person who's promoted to their first management job because they were really, really good at their last job. But then they're given no training in how to be a manager, how to lead people effectively. It's just assumed that because they were great at doing that last job, they can now be great. for example. Yeah, sales is the classic example, isn't it? And so the assumption is that that great Mm -hmm. salesperson will be a great sales manager because they really know sales. But sales management and sales are two completely different, often quite competing uh, skill sets yeah sure. and and so there we you, go that's i wanted to dive into your podcast at this stage mm-hmm. two things really i wanted to learn a little bit more about your podcast okay it would be a disservice to yourself and to our listeners slash viewers to have you on we'll talk about that and to have you mention the podcast that you've been speaking to leaders around the world for so long in so many episodes and we don't learn the name of your podcast and how we can watch or listen, depending on which platforms you use. And then I'd like to just dive into your practices and your leadership training and so on, because you mentioned that this underserved and undertrained group is the group that you primarily focus on. So in whichever order, please tell us a little bit more about your podcast and where we can subscribe, where we can listen, where we can get in and learn a bit more about leadership from you and about your work 
feel free also, let's say you are open to consultations, inquiries, hiring, and so well, not hiring, but you know, being hired. How does someone listening who needs your service who will get in contact with you as well and work with you going forward? Okay, sure. Quite a lot of different questions in one. I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, let's start with the podcast because I think yeah, that's... Yeah. Go on. Podcast and your practice. That's all. Cool. Okay. Okay, so podcast then. It's called Leading with Integrity. You can find it on all of the places where you find podcasts. So we're on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple, and a bunch of the other ones. I can't even remember all of them. It's too much of a list. Um, if you would like a quick place to find it, if you go to www.leadernotaboss.com, you'll find links on that page. So you can go and listen to it. Mm-hmm. Um, what it's about, what it aims at, really, it's it's aimed at any new manager, any first-time leader. Uh, it could also be a first-time founder of their own company. Anyone who wants to learn more about leadership, anyone who is struggling to be effective as a leader, anyone who's starting to feel the loneliness at the top, which is another big challenge when you first become a leader. You Suddenly you can't really talk to all of your colleagues anymore because you're in a position of responsibility. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people feel quite mm-hmm. isolated as a result of that. And so the podcast is there really to share as much knowledge as we can about leadership. For me personally, being a bit mm-hmm. selfish about it, I just love having conversations about leadership. So that's that's why I do it, to mm-hmm. be honest. And if it's helpful for anyone mm-hmm. else, great. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, yeah, I mean, we've had, we've had some amazing guests. We're about to hit... 100 episodes in the next week um Ooh. yeah I brilliant, know. brilliant i don't really know how we've got there it's it's flown by i've obviously been enjoying it uh and we've had some amazing guests i mean we've had a polar explorer um fighter pilot or two who else a reformed bank robber you know all kinds of amazing guests you've got all wow. these really, <laughs> yeah all kinds of amazing guests you've got these really different perspectives on leadership and and they're most of them are usually entrepreneurs as well. And so hearing their journey from being an employee to owning their own business and everything I've learned about leadership along the way, it's, yeah, I love it, which is why I keep doing it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that, sounds, yeah. that sounds beautiful. And from one podcaster to the next, I just want to take just a brief second to say congratulations on approaching your 100th episode. It took some time, but you're here. That's a huge milestone. You should be proud of yourself. I'm proud of you. And I think you've done well to make it this far. I'm very excited to see what you do in the next 100 episodes. And yes, I will be subscribing. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so working my practice. Working with you. Yeah, so yes. working with me. This year, my focus is on building a community of leaders. And so the, the goal is with the podcast, it's it's a free resource that everyone can access, but it's only like an hour a week and it doesn't go into as much depth as I would like on a lot of the really important subjects. So the goal with the community is to give everyone who listens and not just listeners, anyone who needs help with leadership, a place where they can first of all address that problem of loneliness and isolation at the top. So it's a community. The idea is that lo- you know loads of people join it. It's, it's early days at the moment. We've only got about a dozen people in there mm-hmm. right now. But the goal is to have the, a place where you can meet and learn from each other and you can share experiences with mm-hmm. other leaders, other managers who are in a similar place in their careers, who are facing similar challenges and who you, you can talk to relatively freely and not be worried about like you might be if you tried to talk to someone at work about it and the implications that could have, some of the difficulties, yeah. the office politics of it all. You know, we don't always feel comfortable mm-hmm. talking about that sort of stuff at work when we're a leader. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's yeah. kind of the, the primary goal. And then alongside that, there's, mm-hmm. yeah, there's loads of resources on there. I post a couple of times a week. You get early access to the podcast. We do monthly live sessions where we'll cover a different topic each month that's relevant to leadership and new leaders um there's a kind of a networking aspect to it as well it's yeah it's quite an ambitious idea and it's as i say it's quite early so i don't know whether it's going to work yet but fingers crossed um and the same link as before if you head over to that um, leadernotaboss.com you can subscribe there to the newsletter and when you do that you'll be automatically invited the community and we're doing 60 days 
free trial at the moment as well. So, yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I love what you're building. I think that this resource needs to, um, I wouldn't say be popularized because you want to have the right people who are going to contribute, who are looking for answers and who are looking to grow. So I do admire this. Do you work one-on-one with, well, one on many with businesses and employees in these businesses? Or are you more transitioning towards the platform now, towards the community building and so on? Yeah, it's probably the latter. I, I have done a bit of the, the one-to-one stuff in the past. I, I don't enjoy it as much. I Yeah, maybe it's just me. But And then the other thing, I, I mean, there's <laughs> training courses and things available as well. But my goal is, again, I'm going to put all of those through the community in the future. So it is in a period of transition right now. But yeah, I think... Part, part of the thing that I've kind of gone back and forth on a little bit from a strategic point of view for my business is about when you're targeting those new managers, those first-time leaders, quite often mm-hmm. the challenge is because they're not offered that kind of training via their workplace, that means their workplace doesn't want to pay for it. So that means they'll be funding this themselves. And most people in that stage of their career, certainly I, I wasn't when it was me, will have that kind of level of mm-hmm money to spend on those big sort of three, four figure executive training programs that most people are offering. And so that's the other logic behind the community is to offer the same level of quality and content and material, but for an affordable price tag that isn't going to set you back probably for the next three years financially when you're a new manager. So it's it's about making it accessible as well. If you you could perhaps... Leverage, 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 right? <laughs> leverage with an R, not a W. Software and uh, so I'm thinking software such as um, email marketing. You have a website, so you could create an online forum or community. You could also do something like just a WordPress website to create like an online course, something like Lifter LMS or Learn Dash. Just get the videos together put them in Lifter LMS or Learn Dash and you can um, drip the content and you also use email marketing and your online forum. And then to get visibility, you could use a combination of social media, um, affiliates, so social media like Instagram, the TikTok, especially LinkedIn at this stage. So perhaps LinkedIn mm-hmm. more than social um, Instagram and Facebook first. Yeah. And then uh, affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing would come in the form of other bloggers, um, content creators and so on. I speak about leadership. They become an affiliate. They mention your program. They mention your platform. Someone joins joins because when you do the affiliate marketing, it keeps your marketing costs low, and you don't pay unless you're making money. And uh, you could use that if you have Stripe. You could set up Stripe, mm-hmm. and then you could do something like um, a recurring business model. So instead of one upfront payment of let's say three or four figures, you yeah. could say let's say. I'm just throwing a number out here. This is for you to vet. You could say, let's say $99 <laughs> per month. And you get access to the email, to our email. You get access to our mastermind group. You get access to the forum and you get access to the course. So that's four things. And because you're using software, it's easily scalable. You've built the courses. It's going to take some time, of course. You've built the courses. The community is engaged because, like you said, when someone, like a leader, becomes a leader, for, me, for many reasons, they can't just share problems at work. You can't share with Tim the problem you have with, Sa- with Sally because that under- undermines yeah. Sally and that undermines you as well. Oh, right? So you have a yeah. forum where you can talk with like-minded people. Yeah, and, exactly. you know, affiliate marketing is getting in those leads and eyeballs and everything. Just like, ideas floating through my mind that I think you could think about or if you want, you know, we can talk about it separately. But the reason why I'm so excited about this is because leadership is such an important part of leveraging business. And when you can leverage your time and your resources and your skills and so on, then your business can grow. And at Zelen, we're all about helping businesses grow, really. So, you know, you could think about those ideas and you can go from there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some good ideas in there. I've, I've already done a few of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I mean, the, I, I should have said the community is online. It's it's an online community, so anyone anywhere in the yes. world could join it. Um, we use a platform called Heartbeat, mm-hmm. which is quite a popular community uh, software. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've heard of it. I'm, I'm sure several people probably have who are listening. Um, yeah, email marketing, I go through fits and starts with that, I'll be honest. 
And yeah, I spend ages on LinkedIn all the time. So um, yeah. Could we add your LinkedIn to the description of the video so listeners can yeah. also follow and get updates from your posts and so on? Absolutely. Yeah. More than happy. We'll do that. So here's the meat of the matter. Mm -hmm. You are experienced. You know some of the better resources. What are some of the best books or perhaps YouTube channels or podcasts? Because we've listed, listed yours. What are some of the best books, podcasts, people, etc., resources really, that someone interested in improving as a leader could take a look at and start reaping some rewards, you might say? Oh, that's another difficult question, condensing it down again. Um, well, as you can imagine, I read a lot about leadership as often as I can. Um, if we set aside the the academic papers, because that's I struggle with those sometimes, I really do. I wouldn't recommend the average manager to spend their time trying to get their head around those. Uh, there's quite a few I just, mm -hmm. yeah, halfway through, that's it, I'm done, I'm putting it down. Um, but I think <laughs> if if you're brand new to leadership, I would start with... There's a couple of classic books, things like The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. The author's name escapes me right now. Mm -hmm. um, I quite, I'm quite a big fan of Simon Sinek's book as well, Start With Why. It's not explicitly about leadership, but it kind of is, actually. It's more aimed at a business owner, I think. But for any leader, it is quite important to understand why you're doing it. <laughs> because if you don't, then your people won't. Um, I know, right? And and your customers won't add in. Well, quite, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, although someone said to me the other day, starting with why is good, but start with who as well, which I thought was quite an interesting <laughs> observation because mm -hmm. you want the right people in your team as well, don't you? Um, and then there's another book that I would hugely recommend. I'm just going to look up what it's called. I know what it's called. It's, called day, one, it's called day One Leadership. This is Day One. Ooh, day One. And it's by Drew Dudley. Mm -hmm. It has a very good subtitle that I can't remember. But if you search This Is Day One by Drew Dudley, you'll find it on Amazon. Um, he is one of my favorite leadership authors, speakers, trainers. I mean, he does all the things. Um, but his whole mm -hmm. thing is about everyday leadership and what can you do as a leader to have a daily impact? Because as he rightly says, like leadership is this grand idea it's all about aspirations and inspiration but it is more than that as well it's also what are you doing every single day to have an impact in other people's lives and anyone can do that yeah. you don't you don't have to be a ceo you don't have to be a line manager anyone in any any position in any company any organization doesn't even have to be a company does it they can have that impact on people and it can be something simple that just sticks in their memory or makes them feel a bit better or makes them feel seen and heard and valued that particular day and so yeah i mean i highly recommend his book it's it's really worth a read on yeah it's just a different way of looking at leadership that i think could do with spreading <laughs> <laughs> and i agree with you because you know the thing that i've learned in my time there are two things really the first is that um when it comes on to business you can't do it alone right so you're going to need people which leads to the second thing you have to be good at managing yourself as well. You can't have positive relationships when you have your own traumas that you're faced with. So you know a lot of times you've mentioned here quite rightly that if you go to the manager and you say, when, and you, say when you do this, this is how it makes me feel, it's, it creates a better environment, a better um, table for discussion versus saying that, oh, you're such a terrible manager. I cannot believe you would do or say this. That, that's like attacking. That's personal. But you quite rightly said that a lot of times the managers themselves, they think that what they're doing is what's best or it's what they've seen others do. But that also points to their own inefficiencies, which we all have as a human. So, you know, we might grow up in a family where like for myself, having a birthday party was never an objective for me. It's never a goal. If you want to make me upset on my birthday, throw me a birthday party. It's just not <laughs> in my DNA. It's not how I'm built. But for some people, I cannot make, well, they cannot imagine having a birthday come and go without having dinner with friends and family and having a good time. So we also have to be mindful of our own preconceived notions and tendencies and how they influence and affect others as well. 
So it, it's not necessarily complicated, but it does get rather interesting once you start to dive down the um, mentioned rabbit hole, you might say. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think to be really effective at leadership, you've got to be able to, first of all, realize everyone you're leading is an individual, be able to mm -hmm. see them and care about them in that way, and then to use the cliche phrase, get, meet them where they are. You know, you've got to understand yeah. whether it's the birthday party thing or it's, or it could be how do they best communicate. Some people prefer mm -hmm. email. Some people like WhatsApp. Some people, if you don't have a verbal face-to-face -face conversation with them, they're never going to pay any attention to anything you say. And you've got to understand mm -hmm. that. And that is a simple example, but it does have impact on how you lead each individual pe person in your team. You can't just view the team as a whole and just take the same approach to everyone. And in, in the old fashioned way of thinking, that's the way to do it because that's fair. Everyone is treated the same, that's fair. Maybe, maybe it's fair, but it's not the most effective way of doing it. Yeah, um, that's true because everyone's different. Exactly. And then we come back to the communication piece again and the importance of listening. If you're gonna truly understand each person as an individual, you've got to talk to them and listen to what they say. So ask the right questions even. <laughs> ask any questions be a good start <laughs> yeah and actually listen don't just let them talk and then go on your way listen and engage and say oh so why did this make you feel this way what would you have wanted to be done differently it Absolutely. all comes back to actually caring about your people know what you think about it it really does it really does i think yeah i mean i think if you can't care about your people it, it's hard to say that that's like a mandatory requirement of management because if that's the case, probably 90% of managers are going to fail at that because most managers are just in a job the same as their people and they, you know, why should I care? And that speaks to company cultures mm -hmm. again, doesn't it? But I think, yeah, yeah. It's, it is listening. It's I like to say, listen to what they're saying. Don't just hear while you wait for your turn to talk. And that's really the difference, isn't it? Because, yeah, we've all sat in front of a manager who's done that. They're texting while you're talking. You know, they're just waiting for the noise to stop and then it's their turn as opposed to actually listening to what you say. And don't just listen so you can come back with a smart reply. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> that never works. It never worked with your girlfriend or boyfriend. It's not going to work <laughs> with work. And don't, don't do it. Yeah. You know, before you leave, there's an idea I want to float to you. Okay. We had a podcast episode with um, one Dawn Sipley. Now, Dawn Sipley has been in HR for over 25 years. She has her own company. She's quite remarkable. Very, very wonderful person. And she mentioned servant leadership. And I'm going to give you an example of what servant leadership is. It's like what Jesus did when he washed the feet of the disciples. And um, she did it in her company where they had a retreat. They rented a home in the, well, a home with a lake. So I think it's a home on the lake. I don't know. It had a lake. Uh, she made them breakfast. Everyone was talking and having fun, much like a family would. And she said that the thing that it does, it, it does for her business and for others who implement this style of leadership is that whenever you need to criticize, which is such an important topic, we can't even discuss it today, but we do have to mention it. Whenever you have to criticize them and you have to say, um, this was not done up to standard. I think it should have been done at a higher standard, this one needs to be changed and so on. Or there needs to be a difficult conversation about something. She says that it makes it a lot easier because you have that previous bond. It helps them to understand that the feedback, even if it sounds a little bit harsh, it's not personal and it's coming from a place of love. I don't know if you're familiar with servant leadership or perhaps you are, but what do you think yeah. about that style of leadership? Yeah, I am familiar. With servant leadership, I, I like it, and I think there's aspects of it that every leader should be doing. And for me, I think the fundamental part of it is it's what any great leader is doing anyway, and that's putting your people before yourself. Now, that can be very contentious for a lot of people, um, and I've had pushback on it myself where people have said, well, look, if, if I'm putting people first, that means I'm going to burn out first, and then who's going to look after the people once I've burnt out? Which is, I mean, it's a valid worry, I do agree, but, you know, I think, so for me, an example where it's it has impact is we talk about personal development. We've been talking about leadership training for half the, this episode already, haven't we? But part of the responsibility of a leader is to ensure that all of your people have access and opportunity to develop their skills. To do that in a way, in a servant leadership way, means putting that first and letting them choose what training they're going to take up instead of you saying, 
the business needs you to have this skill, so we'll pay for you to do this course, maybe help them mm-hmm. instead develop their own career. And one of the most mm-hmm. impactful things that a leader can do in that situation ultimately is wave goodbye to someone with a smile on their face, knowing that you've helped them take the next step in their career, even if it's not in your team and it's not in your company. That has to be a good thing. That's what effective leadership is all about. And then for a for a middle manager, let's say, another example of great servant leadership is you take the hit for the team, even though it was their mistake, not yours. So your your yes. boss is angry with you, but you protect the team because that is your role. Mm-hmm. And whenever yeah. it's um, time for praise, as they would put it, to be ushered out, you do it in public to those. You never take the credit, always take the blame. Absolutely. Absolutely. Spot on. <laughs> Just a closing note, because, you know, we, have, we do have a schedule and I don't no want worries. to encroach on your time. When um, Walmart first started, if I remember the story I've read correctly, and the story was accurate to begin with, all the disclaimers there. Um, <laughs> when it started, the founder said that he wanted to provide a place for customers to shop that was price friendly. And his way of leading, I don't remember his name, but his way of leadership was that he would put his employees first. He would take care of his employees because he believed that once he took care of his employees, employees would take care of the business. And under that leadership style, Walmart blo- ballooned, really into the behemoth that it is today and a bigger behemoth because since his passing and the reins have been passed over to others it's been it's noted that walmart isn't necessarily the store that you love see move into your neighborhood let's put it that way simply because they don't pay well like there's this one store that someone made the biggest sale in walmart's history and they only offered offered him what a 40 percent um 40 cent increase so 40 cent per hour increase on his salary so you quit immediately and you know there are people who have had similar experiences so don't take care of the employees as well and you can see what's happening to walmart it's not that place that people love to go as they used to anymore so you know that is something to keep in mind yeah there's something in there isn't there about staying true to your founding values because i don't think it's necessarily putting your people first is it if you're paying them notoriously low wages for the market. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's a whole different conversation, isn't there? Oh yeah, it is. It is. And then that also goes into more than ethics and mm. C-suite and all those people. But yeah, that's I mean, a cookie go, to crack for another day. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you pull on that thread too hard, then you, you're you unraveling most of capitalism, aren't you? And then <laughs> and then where does any of our businesses go, right? It's... Uh, I know, right? David, how did you enjoy your time today on the Boardroom Podcast? Oh, it's been lovely. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you again so much for having me. And thank you for your expertise. You're, well, you're soft-spoken, but your words, they carry such weight and brevity. You know, oh, And I you. appreciate that. <laughs> it's never the guy who yells that you really need to listen to. You know, The Bible says that. Uh, it says the cry of a fool is heard less than the speech, the speech of a wise man in a loud city. I think Solomon wrote something like that in Proverbs. Um, given your time today on the Boardroom Podcast, who is one guest that you would like to see on the podcast in the future? And for this guest, we're going to reach out to them. We're going to invite them. What is one question that you would like us to ask them for you when we have them on? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, do you want something realistic or uh, something aspirational? <laughs> aspirational. Okay. Uh, in that case, I would like to know if you could get Simon Sinek on the podcast and ask him oh, yeah. who is the best leader that he has ever worked for. I'd love to Ooh. know the answer to that question. That's if I ever get to interview him, I'm going to ask him that as well. So. That, that's brilliant. <laughs> All right, so we're definitely going to have to reach out to Simon. I think this is the <laughs> third um, request for Simon that we've had. The very first nice. guest that we had on, um, Coach Faith, she is into positive psychology and leadership development. Mm-hmm. She also requested Simon as well. Okay. So definitely looking to reach out to Simon. Yeah. Thank you for your time today, David. You have been brilliant. It's been a wonderful episode. All the links will be posted in the description. 
And we'll also have cards come up with your contact information for LinkedIn and so on that our viewers and listeners can just take a look at and they can reach out to you. They can join your community and they can go from there. Lovely. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Have a wonderful day. You as well. Cheers.